it's been a long time coming. But this video is sponsored, and it's by the developers. Dino Polo Club wants me to let you know that the new challenge mode is now available for you to play, along with so many more improvements to the game. We'll talk more about challenge mode specifically at the end of the video, but there's many more improvements that have been made, including new settings, ranking updates, new achievements, updated color options, and so much more. For a full list of changes, keep an eye out for the patch notes wherever you play. And with that out of the way, let's jump straight into part three of this deep dive series. We know a lot about how the game grows and evolves already. We've dug into the pip growth mechanics, we know lots about the basic roadways in this game, and we've even started identifying how the cars, roads, and buildings interact with each other. Now it's just a matter of understanding some of the more complicated components of the game, which is why this video has a focus on two major components, acceleration and roundabouts, and maybe a little bit about traffic lights. And there is a reason for these to be the topic of this video. When I started this investigation, two things were fresh in my mind. First, I already knew that there was a car acceleration curve for the game. We started investigating that in the last deep dive. And second, I had just recently had an experience where a roundabout, something that I used to think was perfection incarnate, caused the untimely end to my game. And that just kept happening over and over again. It wasn't a perfect highway structure anymore. And yes, there's a, still a couple bugs with the roundabouts, but it still got me thinking. What makes a roundabout good, and what will cause it to fail? By the way, side note, while I was testing the new update, I didn't have any issues with the roundabouts or traffic reroutes, so it looks like they might have squashed most, if not all, of the biggest bugs. So kudos to them. That, of course, is future talk. Back when I was testing roundabouts, I sent myself into some pretty wonky road designs, where I would purposefully halt traffic in order to artificially induce congestion. But that just kind of reinforced the idea that I created in the first of these deep dives. If you can't move it, you lose it. So, about a week ago, I really started thinking about it. And what I realized was that roundabouts weren't causing issues, but it was the acceleration of the cars that was causing the issues. Back on August 24th, Dino Polo Club made what turned out to be a bit of a bombshell of a patch that is still ringing in the ears of all the people that play their game. A buff to traffic lights, a huge nerf to slipways, and an increase in the growth multiplier that controls the speed at which the game accelerates. I'm calling it a bombshell because, well, it really was. Don't believe me? Go look at the leaderboards for any of the maps prior to the newest. Those were all around before August 24th. Now look at Wellington, a map that has spent its entire life on the newest patch. The scores are a bit different. It's extraordinarily tough to get to 10k now, let alone 200k. This is the starting point for our dive today. What did the August 24th patch do to the game in the leaderboard? And how are acceleration, roundabouts, and traffic lights interconnected? It's going to be a bit of a mix between the math that you expect from these dives and a discussion that I hope rings true for most. So sit back, relax, and prepare for the third installment of our Mini Motorways Deep Dive series. So, the roundabout. It's a pretty simple traffic exchange that takes up a large amount of space. Cars feed in, travel around, and then feed out. It's more efficient than intersections, better for flow compared to traffic lights, and it's just the right size to fit a tree in the middle. Overall, pretty awesome. On the technical end of things, it can hold a variably large number of cars, and that's something that we'll get into later on. For now, we'll just say that the maximum it can service is somewhere between three and five cars. Now that's not particularly great compared to just, you know, setting up a couple intersections to handle traffic, but it has a unique advantage that became very apparent after Slipways got hit over the head with the nerf bat. In its best case scenario, and its average case scenario, traffic flow is unimpeded regardless of the number of connections you put onto the motorway and the roundabout. Try that with just roads, and you're in for a very horrible experience. But that's why we use them. We want to maximize traffic flow, which, I mean, duh retro. That's the entire premise of the game. But trust me, I'm going somewhere with this, because there's a layer below this dive that isn't discussed, and that's... Yes, acceleration. The derivative brother to velocity and the integrative cousin of jerk. It tells us the rate of change of an object, and lets us know how quickly things are speeding up. Mini motorways cars have a max velocity of 3 tiles per second. And outside of the motorways, that's the fastest mode of travel in the game. In a perfect world, we want those cars to spend as much time moving at their maximum velocity as possible, with the only places that they slow down being at the start and end points. In fact, Let's do a bit of math to create a baseline to express this a little bit better. In our first deep dive, we generated a pip growth rate, and in our second deep dive, we calculated car velocity. If we were to combine these data points from both of the dives into one formula, we could express the current number of cars needed to satisfy the current pip requirements, based on the average distance from start to end. Remember, we're still talking about the best case right now, so let's pretend there's no interruptions to traffic. For the average travel in this best case scenario then, we can count the number of tiles between the closest house and the destination, and then for each other house on the route, 
We take that initial count and add the remaining tiles on the path to the next house. Diagonals are considered root 2 units long, so every two diagonal tiles round up and count for three tiles. Repeat for all the houses connected to your root and divide by the number of houses that you have. And that's the average number of tiles between your destination and your houses, which you could then divide by three to calculate the approximate average travel time, since the cars move at three tiles per second. Now this is a moving average, and that's a very important thing to note. Adding more houses that are more distance will increase the average, and a closer group will reduce the average. What matters is that you can now plug a combination of houses into your PIP growth rate and see if your current population can sustain the PIP spawn rate. Let's say the PIP spawn rate is currently at 2 per second, and your average distance is 21 tiles. First, convert the average distance to an average travel time by dividing by 3, leaving you with an average travel time of 7 seconds. Each house has two cars, so with a travel time of 7 seconds, you'll need 14 cars traveling in one direction at a time to match the current PIP rate. Note that's only one direction though, and the cars still have to travel back to their houses before they can be used again. This does mean that closer houses will have a higher carrying capacity than the other houses. But for now, this is a good estimate. If you really want the precise answer, you could calculate each travel time separately, plot out the rotations in an Excel sheet, while also factoring in return times into the equation, identifying a critical point where distance between the houses and destinations is a detriment, and then you'd know exactly how many cars you need to support the route, but... Well, you know, that's also a lot of work, and you would have to redo it every single time you change your route. So, yeah, probably not worth it. What's better is to follow the Occam's Razor approach to the whole thing and reach back into the very early days of this game. And remember that if you still have a car in the house connected to your route, by the time the initial car or set of cars returns, then you're still likely maintaining coverage for that route. Where you get into trouble is when there's a delay between the last car leaving and the next car departing. Then you have a pip ticking up and nothing is moving. It's basically dead time and a lost pip on that structure. Now, I'm not saying all that funky junky math isn't worth it, it's just not practical in most cases unless you're at 9k trips and really want to min-max your way to the top score. In that case, spending a bit more time making sure your routes are optimized is probably a good idea. One final bonus about this analytical method is that you can use it in conjunction with your other knowledge about pip sharing to load share between a struggling location and a much more stable location with a more local population. If surge comes along, and you're ahead of the current pip rate, then overload can be thrown at the other destination nation with more local populations, since their turnaround time will be faster and you can service it more often. This can save you from over-allocating to one location and causing congestion, which would then in turn cause more slowdowns and potentially end the game. Okay, we got into the weeds with that one, so let's pull back to our thoughts on roundabouts and acceleration. Roundabouts are great as long as flow rates are high and interruptions are low. The problem arises when too many populations are trying to use the roundabout. In the worst case, entire lines of cars are backed up so far, you might as well have just used a traffic light. What's more upsetting to me though, is the slowdown. That's a deceleration, which will require an acceleration to correct. That means there's a period of time where we're not pushing cars along optimally, and the effects dig deeper than you'd first imagine. From some straight line testing, I calculated that the total distance to achieve maximum speed was about 4 or 5 tiles. I say 4 or 5 because the difference is negligible and could be chalked up to missing frames here or there when I was recording. So best case, 4 tiles to get to full speed, and worst case, 5 tiles. It's why the slipway change from the August 24th patch that slows down cars when merging was so hard to adapt to, and to come full circle, yes that was a pun, why roundabouts are the best and worst traffic reward in the game. Excluding all of the talk about the game breaking bugs associated with the roundabouts, they can single handedly cripple your traffic or save you from massive issues with deceleration. They are the average case solver, but will kill you in the worst case possible. And now let's pull in a little bit closer to roundabouts and talk only about them. Because most of my thought over the last few weeks was trying to figure out these little circular traffic traps, especially after, uh, well, you know, this happened. Hoping to avoid that again, I started looking at different inflow and outflow ideas. Two that worked relatively well were the quad and tri-spoke, but even these were kind of limited. In the testing they worked fine, but there were limitations in my methodology of sending all of them at the same time. If you had traffic traveling on their own circuits and going back and forth at the same time, it'd be much more chaotic when using the quad spoke, and you're probably better off just using a traffic light if you're just merging two groups. Set up the joining branch to take a right hand red onto the main line, and the interruptions are barely noticeable most of the time. Tangentially, by the way, because of the preciseness that comes with the right hand red rule, at least in terms of their timings in the code, cars wanting to take advantage of this need to be traveling at top speed. 
If they're traveling too slow, the lights won't properly switch back once they're clear through the intersection, causing slowdowns on the main road. This clip shows a driveway that is too close to the main road, causing this issue. If you need to merge a traffic light like this, it's always best to set up an acceleration zone before merging the traffic, which again requires full speed, or four or five tiles depending on where the cutoff point is for this right-hand red rule to take effect. So that was it, right? More than four spokes was just a bad idea? You'd basically have three or four different colors on that roundabout, which is just asking for death. Three and four aren't worth the effort, and two spokes is just a roadway with extra concrete. Defeated, I left it, but kept thinking about it for the next month. Then it hit me. If we want to optimally use roundabouts, what we want to do is reduce the chance of deceleration by congregating all of the exit points together, preferably with the entrances clockwise from the exits. That means that when returning to the destination, it's basically an unimpeded straight shot home, with no cars cutting any others off. This sounds complicated, but let me show you what I mean. Let's generate a four-spoke roundabout and attach the entryways clockwise from their exits. The order of the entrances or exits don't really matter, only that all the exits are directly before the entrances and there's no mixing. We'll play this clip in the background and watch the carnage, except, almost surprisingly, there's not much carnage. Sure, there's a lineup at the entrances to the roundabout. That's understandable given how many cars I just told to rush through it. But look at what happens once they start coming back from the destination. They're just kind of flowing. No interruptions, they all just take the path that they need to take and then requeue as necessary. By arranging the exits together and using as little space on the roundabout as possible, we've left a large open area for return trips to come through on. The only place where traffic stops now is between the exits. And that's only momentarily if there's another car coming back. This fixes our issues with roundabouts, and is the most optimal setup I've been able to theorycraft yet. You could even in emergency set this up as a 5 or 6 spoke, and probably do just fine for a while. The key takeaway though is that the exits can't be mixed with the entrances, otherwise you're in for a very, very bad time. So that's the math. Or, well as close as we're going to get to the math for a little bit. We're getting closer and closer to the meta level of these kinds of things, and our talk will slowly change to become more and more of that upper level thinking. Now before the end of the video, I think that this is an important time to tangentially jump to a related subject. As I mentioned at the start, this video is sponsored by Dino and Polo Club, and I'll happily use my platform to express an undying gratitude to what they've been doing so far. This challenge mode patch comes with so much quality of life that it speaks volumes to me. In fact, it comes on the heels of a six year patch for Mini Metro. A new map just came out, by the way, you should go try it out. I read every single comment that is written on this channel. And they've received a good amount of flack for the August 24th patch. Some of it from me because of the leaderboards that weren't reset, and maybe not reset yet, and can you tell that I'm recording this before the patch comes out? Haha. <laughs> but with the introduction of both challenge mode and the histograms, you can see how strong you are compared to everyone else in these tough situations that we're putting ourselves through. And visually see it through the histograms. The histograms are definitely my favorite part of the patch. It shows me very plainly where I still need to improve and where I've peaked. Remember the 10k Wellington challenge that I tried to complete and stopped at 6k because it seemed like we were peaking out? Looks like I was right, at least based off of the histogram. Now of course alongside all this are the challenge modes for each new map. Each one is custom tailored to the map itself and new challenge properties have been introduced as well. I've personally tried the rush hour challenge because I've wanted to see what an even faster difficulty curve would look like and it's kind of insane. Now I won't show you the run itself, but I did go through the pain of mapping out the first 14 weeks of pip growth, and I also mapped out the pip growth in Los Angeles on the December 10th patch to compare to the pre-August 24th data that I collected for the Deep Dive series episode 1. On the screen from left to right are the pre-August 24th rates, the December 10th rates, and the rush hour challenge mode rates. And if you're wondering what the rush hour graph translated to, here's what I had to say after my first attempt on it. Oh boy, that was rough. So if you want to play any of the new challenge modes, download the latest update and give them a try. And let me know in the comments if you want to see my best attempts at any of the challenge runs out there. For now though, I think it's time to say goodbye for now, and thank you very much for watching. And thanks again to Dino Polo Club for sponsoring this video, and I will see you all in the next one.